Welcome everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Our guest of honor today is Henrietta Mantooth. Um, as you all know, she is at the height of a very long and illustrious and energetic career as a painter, uh, as a set designer, and very importantly as a writer. And the first time I had the opportunity to meet Henrietta was when you were in the residency program last year at doing a writing residency. Um, you might know that Henrietta has training as a journalist um, and has, has, has done a lot of journalistic writing and that's something that I feel is extremely relevant to her eye. She has a very probing eye that really knows how to get to the gut of a story. Um, and so I'm, I'm just so happy to have you here with us today. Um, the show is curated by Nancy Azara and Matthew Leacraft, who have both <laughs> with Birdcliff in, in various ways over the years have been very supportive of us and we're grateful to them as well. So I'm going to turn the floor over to them. I was going to ask for a round of applause to welcome our guests. You can do it again. <laughs> I welcome you. Without this, or can you not? Yes, yes. No, not back there. Yeah, we're great. Yeah. All right, so let's put this on. Maybe testing. So I just got a little distracted by all of the different wonderful people, wonderful friends, artists, um, members of our community who came today. And about a quarter to three, we thought oh, maybe no one's going to come. It's such a beautiful day. And then Duran reminded us it's Woodstock. So if they get busy by 3.15, everybody will be here. And here you are. So welcome. We're very happy to have you. Uh, Henrietta and I have known each other for uh, several years. I was trying to think today maybe about 15 or so. Uh, we met as um, participants in a group of women artists in the area. And I think we met for about four or five years. And we knew each other since uh, MS Magazine. Well, <laughs> in 1971, I wrote an article about women who paint women for Ms. Magazine. And Henrietta Bagley Mantu was one of the artists I put in that article. And I hadn't remembered. But of course, I wrote the article, and I haven't written many more since then. But Henrietta was part of the article, so she would remember. And as artists know, that's the kind of thing that you do. So she said, oh, you wrote about my work in 1971. <laughs> and so we had that connection at that point, and I do remember her work, because we were, um, Ms. Magazine wanted uh, someone to write an article about women who were interested in doing self-portraits, or portraits of other women because we were looking for a sense of self with a different kind of image, an image that was much stronger and not objectified that we had lived with before. And perhaps that's the best way to begin to make a segue into Henrietta's work, because it has a power and a strength to it and a self-possession uh, that we're really happy and excited to see. And its political aspect, I think, with its self-possession, and a kind of spiritual underlay is something that both Matt, both Matt and I um, have had a dialogue about for a while. So uh, welcome Henrietta, and I'm going to pass my uh, comments on to Matt. Well, I first, um, I first met Henrietta three years ago uh, when she uh, came to the Berkeley Artist Residency Program. And you know, you those of you who know our residency, the residency program at Birdcliff will know that the, the people who apply, the people who come, uh, tend to be in their early part of their career. And so 
I, too. I know. <laughs> so, so, so I remember the first night I met her. We were had there was a communal dinner at at Rudcliffe, and there were these thirty something people standing around in the kitchen, and Henrietta, and by the time I was talking with Henrietta for five minutes, I felt that actually she was the youngest person in the room, in spirit, <laughs> and the most free. Um, you know, which is really the quality, I think, that so distinguishes the work that you see here and why I loved going to her studio uh, so much, uh, to see her uh, talking about and interacting with her own work in a way that there's something so vivid about um, the energy in her that comes through in the work. And it's sort of what Nancy said that, you know, while the work, the work exists in its own formal, artistic plane and at the same time it reveals some a, a deeper kind of spiritual and political kind of truth and you really don't find all of those things working at the same time very often so it's 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 a, it's a unique thing and it was a unique experience for me to meet and get to know Henrietta and to spend some time uh, thinking about uh, this particular body of work but I think that I think we should hear from Henrietta now yeah. <laughs> well, let's see. Um, I just want to mention one of my very good friends came from California. Can you hear? Yeah. Uh, uh, and been working with me for five weeks in all kinds of different things, plus going to the market and getting fresh vegetables, making soups, and and hanging my work and showing me where I should paint this or that. So she was a combination, and I, and she worked until till uh, six o'clock last night when we finished the show, and she got sick last night. So she's not here, so she's a fantastic photographer, I hope sometime, and especially she works with wild horses and uh, trying to save them from dog food. And uh, so I just wanted to mention her name because she was so important. I don't think I could have gotten this show together without her. Julia Brandt. Thanks, girl. And, uh, and Matt <laughs> have supported me to this very moment. <laughs> Thank you both. Um, we had some nice differences of opinion, which made it really, really fun, right? And we worked it out. Okay, first I want to start with a story, and uh, it's about my it, it's about my grandson Kieran, who just turned fifteen. And the uh, family has, has two dogs, Rhoda and, uh, and uh, Dugan. And recently, Kieran said to his father, Dad, Dugan and Rhoda are real. And louder. Um, oh, can't hear. Oh, Kieran said to his father about his two dogs, Dugan and Rhoda said, Dad, Dugan and Rodan, uh, 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 Dugan and Rhoda are real. And to me, that began a whole train of uh, not only thought but feeling about how most things aren't real for us. I have to speak for myself. I don't know how, how others feel. But I would like to, to, by this show, especially the installation, I would like to make the point that those behind bars, both the innocent and the guilty, are real. And I hope, you can applaud, they deserve it. <laughs> and I don't, I don't think we realize that all the time, because we live our own lives, our own worries, our own children, our own professions. and. Uh, they're there, and they're, uh, uh, they're filed. That's a file box. There's a big file box in the USA. It's called File Box USA. And it includes, as I say, the guilty and the innocent and the youthful who don't even get enough food because they're, they're adolescents and they have to eat a lot at that time. So they're, and even those who aren't well mentally, 
are in that. So I think I just want them to be real to us. And that's why I did this installation. Um, and thank you, Kieran, for reminding me what's important in life. In fact, all of you are real too. <laughs> You're not just friends that show up for my show. You're real, each one of you. Um, it, it's always hard because, as he said, I, I work in a very free way. I have these slumps. Maybe if you don't work that way, you have slumps too. But um, recently I had a big slump. I said, I'll never get this show together. Mm -hmm. Then I remembered um, a woman geneticist, um, Barbara McClintock. I don't know if you have heard of her. But she worked her whole life in a man's world, struggling as a geneticist to have a, a lab to work in and a field to work in and so forth. And she, um, and, and her, her, her um, experiments were kind of laughed at or not taken seriously. So when she was in her 80s, she got a, a Nobel Prize for genetics. And um, uh, she, she, uh, she, they, they made a big fuss about her, of course. She was the first woman who got a Nobel Prize uh, by herself, not uh, joint. So she said, I don't know what the fuss is all about. I just asked the corn. So I thought, yeah, that's what you can do. Whatever problem you have, you just ask whatever you're working with. So I decided to ask the birds that I was working with, <clears throat> the painted birds. And so I sat in my studio and looked at the birds, and I asked them, and they answered me. Each one, the big ones and the little ones, the yellow ones, the blue one, told me their story. And I, and, then there was silence, and then I heard one long bird call outside my studio window. So I thanked the birds and went back to work. So, um, you know, if you get in trouble, ask whatever. Sometimes I ask my paintings, what shall I do next? What, what do you, why? Once I was at an at, at a artist residency, and I was about to leave, and I had an open studio, as I usually do. And I invited everybody. I'm very optimistic, right? <laughs> so uh, a very well-known sculptor couldn't come the day, uh, the night of the opening. So she said, could I come the day before? So I said, okay, she came. She looked at everything and she didn't say anything. She said, well, thanks, and she left. <laughs> well, I was a pretty young painter at that time, so I was devastated. And uh, so I said, I can't give this open studio. This is no good. Um, I have to cancel it. And then I sat down and I looked at a couple of paintings I was working on, especially one. And it was a New York family, two women and three children. And they just said, what about us? <laughs> and so I said, okay, I'll just get a big tub of sangria and make people feel welcome. <laughs> So I had a good time doing that. Um, I, found, I find as I get older that I want to use simpler materials. I mean, I've gone through all kinds of artist materials. In fact, I have enough to last me the rest of my life, even though I'm going to live another 10 years. And uh, so, um, but recently I had this suddenly love of cardboard, corrugated cardboard and <coughs> brown paper. And um, Alan gave me a big roll of his when I was about to run out. So I find, maybe that comes from my childhood when, when we never had any artist materials except um, a box of Prang watercolors and uh, a box of Crayolas. So most of the paper dolls that my sister and I made, our own, had lined. Uh, they were big chief tablets, I don't know. Either. So I love all that ordinary material. In fact, my biggest uh, inspiration was um, a mud hole that my mother amazingly let us have right in front of the house, a big mud hole. 
And uh, I still can have that feeling of an old tin can pouring the water into the mud, <laughs> turning it around and so forth. So I think a mud hole's good for everybody. So, <laughs> so this, uh, the, the materials uh, uh, have to do with that, simple materials that, uh, that maybe have to do. Well, Picasso said something like this, the, the meaning and the technique are discovered simultaneously. So it seems to me that those, those kind of materials go with, with the, the prisons and the inmates. And Microphone, please. Oh, sorry, okay, how's that? <laughs> oh, too much. Okay. She says when I run out of anything to say, she'll to come in. I, I grew up, when I grew up it was the lower middle, I was in the lower middle class. And um, it's funny, it's different from now. I don't know about the lower middle class now. I don't think anybody here is from it. But in my day, you could go anywhere from the lower middle class. It was a, a Great Depression time, but there was some kind of an opportunity. I don't know, uh, you could either hopefully go to college, which almost nobody in my family had done, but um, it, it was a hopeful time, maybe because it was the time that Roosevelt came in. And, um, you know, Matt said that I have a lot of freedom in my work, but I want to tell you that freedom causes problems. For instance, if you're going to give a show, how to put it all together. I mean, how to put this piece together? I with Julia were here because she packed it up in New York. Can you imagine packing up that, <laughs> and then unpacking it and taping it down? So it's great to be free if you have people around you which <laughs> pull it all together. Yeah, tell me some, uh, ask me some questions. Yes. Yeah. Well, I wanted to know, are you ready? One more thing. Go ahead. Uh, someone, uh, I read recently that someone had, had uh, discovered that there were more than 2,000 languages in the world. And, uh, oh, oh he, uh, he discovered that there were 2,000, uh, around 2,000 languages in the world. Uh, so the thing <coughs> is in that there must be that many ways of listening, right? And uh, I, I'm, I'm, not like a, I'm a person who's scared in the woods, and I live in the woods, and I have to walk a ways to get there. And uh, so I'm always looking at the trees. So this last, I hadn't been there for a while, but I was there last week. It was raining, and there were all these dark trees. So I thought, maybe the tree is, could be friendly. <laughs> so I tried to make friends with the tree, and it really helped. And I, I think maybe the tree has some something to say to me, too. So, And one other thing I meant to say, there was a guru in Woodstock, you remember her name, uh, the woman who said, you can't have love and fear together. You either have one or the other. If you have fear, you can't love, and if you have love, you won't fear. Well, I've been trying to follow that for the last couple of weeks, just just for fun, right? <laughs> and um, and it kind of does relieve the... Someone told me years ago when I was a young uh, artist in Brazil, he was a poet and a critic, and he said, Henrietta, when you love your work more, it will be wonderful. So I decided this week I'm gonna love it. <laughs> so, so uh, and I know some of you do too, so <laughs> thank you. and then Matt may too. Um, but we'll keep it brief because we do want to hear from the audience. So we'll be first. Um, Henrietta and I, uh, we did have a few disagreements because uh, we were Matt and Henrietta and I because we were hanging the show. And there was one piece that Henrietta absolutely insisted on and it's called Jim Crow. And it's a long, narrow piece in the back. If you can't see it now, you can probably take a look later. Um, it's called the timeless Jim Crow. Okay, and she said, I have to have that piece in the show. I'm going to be just so unhappy. 
and I didn't want to make her that unhappy, so we came to terms with it, of course, and it's in the show. But my question is, okay, since that piece had to be in the show, and it's about the timeless Jim Crow, can you give us a little bit of an explanation about it? Because it seems to me that you were so connected to it, it was almost a seed for the work, for the work, rest of the work that's in the show, or much of the rest of the work, particular for the installation. So how would you characterize that particular piece in relationship to the rest of the show and the idea of Jim Crow, which I'm just going to make a small little comment here. You grew up in Kansas City, Missouri, and I don't, I, I don't know enough about Kansas City, Missouri to know if it was how much of the Deep South it was, but you probably grew up in the middle of Jim Crow. That's right. I never went to school with anyone that was even swarthy. <laughs> I remember three sisters came from Greece, and they somehow slipped by. And uh, my, my friend was a middle one named Tess. But um, I, I, uh, we, there was, you couldn't go into a restaurant until recently uh, with an Afro-American. And besides that, are there any Afro-Americans here? Wow, I should have brought a token. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are several swarthy types. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, um, okay, anyway, I, I, when I went to college, University of Missouri in the School of Journalism, we were totally, we couldn't even meet socially with Afro-Americans. That was a state law. And uh, so we did meet with them, and we were, uh, they, they told us if we continued to do that, we would be expelled. So I grew up, yes, I, I remember across the street from where we lived in, a, in one of the lower class districts, there were three Filipino brothers, and they were married to ca Caucasian women. And when, they, when the women would walk their babies up and down the street, it was across the street from where I lived, and people would say, look at that, isn't that a shame? And I thought, what, what, what is it? So I grew up totally in a segregated world. But my parents never talked about, never said anything against anybody black or swarthy or so forth. My mother did say she didn't believe in mixed marriages because it's hard on the children. And my father was Jewish, and my mother was Irish Cherokee, and uh, my my. Father's family never accepted us, so she, nor did they accept her. So uh, she had that experience, so that's why. Okay. No, I wondered how it affected this world. Oh, well, how did <laughs> <laughs> it here? Uh, yeah, well, uh, I think one of the things, for instance, that piece that I love, I just love the people in that piece, and it's also, I noticed uh, now, it's, uh, it's painted on a piece of styrofoam, and it was part of a, of a, of a theater piece uh, called The Piano Lesson. Um, it was part of the sculpture on the, on the piano that was carved by a slave. So that's just, it was, and that was done a few years ago. It was a, a, a group of black people uh, just together. And um, I don't know if anyone knows that play, The Piano Lesson. Uh, yeah. I, uh, was uh, uh, Wilson, I uh, forget his first name. Not Lambert. Uh, August. 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 What? August. Yeah, August Wilson's play, The Bennett List. So that was a piece of the piano. But um, I just, that piece speaks to me. That's all I can say. I have to, I couldn't betray it by not putting it in the show. So I guess. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Well, Henry, I'm curious for you to say more about uh, the evolution of your concern for the people who are on the outside. How, how did that, how did that, there has to be, a, must have been quite a journey there. No, it started very early because uh, it was a time of the Depression when I grew up and uh, often my family couldn't pay the rent, so we moved quite a bit from place to place. Sometimes I would come home from school, turn on the light, and there was no light, 
So I remember kids are very practical. I thought, when am I going to do my homework tonight? So, uh, and, uh, and we did have a little house in the country. And um, when I was about nine, that was foreclosed. So when I see the word, you know, foreclosure is just a word you read in the newspaper. But to a kid, no one's explained anything to us in those days. It, everything just disappears. You know, oh, what happened to, I, I did keep my Shirley Temple doll. But, um, but you didn't know what happened. Sometimes I'd say to my sister when we were old, what, you, what happened to that? What happened to that little iron stove we had in the mud hole? Things just disappear. So it's a big word, foreclosure. But I think that maybe something without me admitting it as a child, because I held my pride, right? Um, I, maybe, I've, maybe I had a feeling of being a refugee. Um, maybe that it started there. And then the fact that that house, that one with the poem next to it, uh, really represented it, the little house that was foreclosed. It was very small, but you know it had a great patch, and we made wine and so forth. So, also for some reason, I don't know uh, if it could be former life or something, but I loved Mexicans when I was a kid, but I never saw one. Uh, only one I saw was Dolores Del Rio, who was my favorite movie star. And when we played movie stars, which we did a lot, I was Dolores Del Rio. I, and, uh, and then the, the first place I went, when I, after two years of college, a friend and, and I went to Mexico City and uh, did six weeks in the university, Spanish and Spanish literature. So that was my first contact with real Mexicans. And then uh, later I went to Venezuela, where I lived for five years. And uh, we, I worked in an office building, and downstairs there was a person they called a fishwife and her husband, and she made wonderful lunches for all of us. We'd go down there and we'd sit around a big table at lunchtime and eat this wonderful food and bread, and uh, everyone was yelling about politics and insulting somebody else, and, but nobody took it that way. I thought, oh, I'm home. I came home. <laughs> I felt so good that uh, people just spoke out, you know, and no one took it personally. Or as far as I know, I mean, you might get a bullet, but. <laughs> so then after that, I went to, Venice, to Brazil, where I lived for about 11 years, where my two sons were born, and uh, Alex and David. And, um, and then, so I, had, I think that influenced me a lot. I mean, the, the La Rosa, that's the Zapatista, that's the story of the uprising in the, in the south of Mexico, which happened, um, I don't know how many years ago, but um, it, really, um, it really changed this group of farmers and, uh, and Indians in south Mexico, the poorest state in Mexico. I think influenced the politics in Mexico. It changed the government, and I think it also influenced the politics in Latin America, which is seemed to be creeping out of uh, the U.S. influence somewhat. Um, so, did I answer your question? Okay. Shall we open it now? Yes. Okay. Uh, Mary, uh, you had a Mary human question. Yeah. I, do you want to take the mic or? Yeah, you see. Uh, yeah. Well, I just wanted to ask you because I know you were an actress for a number of years, and I always feel there's a very big aspect of performance in a very beautiful way and powerful. So I just wondered if you wanted to talk about that. Yes, I love to talk about the theater because I learn more on stage about life than, I can't say than that I learned in life, but. It's a place where you can live so intensely without, well, you have the fear of being in front of everybody, but you don't have the fear of raising your voice or crying or accusing somebody or even shooting somebody. So you have a great deal of freedom on stage. And I think one of the things I remember, in fact, I was thinking of it today when uh, I, was, I went into a new play. I was the only one who was new, and the director, his name was Marshall Mason, 
He said, Henrietta, this is your time and your space. Take it. And that was like 30 years ago, maybe. But I remember when I read my first story at the, at the cafe here in Woodstock, I was so nervous and I got up at the mic and then suddenly I remembered Marshall saying, this is your time and your space, take it. And I did. <laughs> and so also, another thing I remember from theater is, uh, is that if you get in trouble on stage, put your attention on the other actor or the activity. In other words, you don't think, how am I doing? So how am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> Pleasure to meet you and an honor. I'm in a place where I'm trying to paint from my in interior, but I have Henrietta Mantu's uh, work in my studio, liberating my free. I mean, it's just fabulous. But I did want to say in your talk, I've always been curious, I've been a fan for many years, um, of your name. And the name now makes sense if your mom was Cherokee Irish. And I'm curious if the Cherokee inheritance isn't a great part of your talking to the trees, um, loving the, the birds, having, having things have their life. Um, I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad you mentioned that. I, I forgot about that. Um, Yes, I had a, I took my name from my maternal grandmother. Her name was Elizabeth Mantooth. And I looked her up and she is listed in the Cherokee Nation. Um, uh, and I think her father was half Cherokee, from Tennessee. They were, I guess they came over from Carolinas, right? And uh, not long ago, someone did a reading for me and, and the question I asked, I didn't mention any of that, but the question I asked is, why do I have this, this enormous sadness coming over me sometimes? And she said, do you have anything, uh, anything a Native American? Uh, it, does it have anything to do with the trail of tears? And you know, I think it does. So what you said, I think, has, has strong influence. I mean, I, when I was a kid, of course, I didn't have a lot of things to be proud of. But secretly, I was proud that I was part Indian. <laughs> <laughs> and also, I was proud because I had a great grandmother, a Tennessee hillbilly, who lived to be 113. <laughs> so I'm raising it three more years. <laughs> and, uh, and she smoked a corncob pipe. And she had a shot of, of uh, corn whiskey every morning. <laughs> <laughs> so we could do scotch, right? <laughs> right? Yeah. All right, another question? Yeah. I just wanted to know. No, I don't think people can hear you. If you could, you don't think so? No. 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 I mean, I can, repeat the, I can repeat the question, but it's better with you. Okay. I just wanted to know how, um, what started you on this idea of the jail? What, what, what inspired you to do that particular? When you ask me that question, I, I suddenly hear the sound of the, the, the steel gates opening and closing. I had a brother who, uh, well, they finally decided he was schizophrenic or whatever, but in the meantime, he spent some time in jail and once my son and I went to visit him in prison, I think Alex was about eight, but that sound of, of those gates opening and closing, you know, sound is a powerful thing. And uh, I guess that's why listening is so important. Um, so maybe, maybe it came from that. I also had two uh, uncles who were morphine addicts and were in and out of of a jail, they were vagrants or whatever they did. They were in and out of a place called the farm, which was uh, where they put them to uh, try to, you know, just put them to, to give up drugs. 
Anyway, those two uncles did, they used to come over to our house and uh, they'd be talking to us and then, you know, they'd go in and shoot up and, and then come out and they'd be talking and would fall asleep. Uh, so that's why I never really got into drugs, even though this is full stock, you know. So <laughs> I, I, uh, I forego that one. But they were the kindest of the relatives that I had. So maybe that had to do with them, seeing their lost lives, you know. And, and no help. There was no help, really. They were just put in jail or, or in, at the farm. And the way it's happening now, by the way. All right, we have time for another question or two. Yes? Related to the question before, people associate the new Jim Crow with the Michelle Alexander book. Yeah. And I wonder whether you had a chance to read that, whether you read it, whether it's influenced you're going in this direction, and whether she might know about your work, which I think would be something she'd be very interested in. Yes, I heard about... Did everybody hear what you yes. said? Yes. yes. In the back? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, I did hear about her and uh, about the book, and I haven't had time to read it, but um, I looked at, at some of the writing online, and I'm very interested. In fact, someone came into the gallery yesterday and said that she knew the person who had started the New Jim Crow group in Kingston, and she took some of the cards from this show and said that she would advise them. One more question, all the way in the back. Yeah. Yes. Henry, um, you obviously uh, uh, pay a lot of attention. You give a lot of thought to, to intuition, uh, or the role of intuition in your work. Could you uh, speak a little bit about uh, the presence of intuition and, and what it, uh, uh, and its presence uh, in your process? Yes, I think it's a very important part of my process. Um, I don't know how to explain it. Um, um, I don't even have an example right now, though. I'm sure if we talk afterwards and have a glass of wine, I'll think of something. <laughs> because it does play a big part. And uh, I think so much that I think I count on it. Um, uh, I count on intuition and my hand. Um, I now have carpal tunnel, but it's still working. <laughs> so uh, I, I think it's a very important part of my of my work and and my living. Okay, one more question, Tim. Sylvia, did you have your hand up? No. Yes. Uh, I was just curious about the uh, uh, names on the wall of the various places. Could you yes. talk a little bit about that? Yes, have you read them? I've been reading them a little bit, yeah. Oh, I think if you read them, it will be... Make sense. It, okay. it will make sense. Okay. But it's the, it's the list of the 69 prisons in New York State. Okay. And that doesn't count a lot of them in the city. And by the way, I have some extra prison bars which you all can take home <laughs> there. Kieran, did you get your prison bar? Did you stop him from getting his? I did not stop him. Okay. I freed him, I freed him unintended. Okay. Um, anyway, some of them have the names of the prisons, and you can take them home. And some of them are blank. We didn't have time to put them all. But you can each write your own prison on it. Like, one thing would be like fixed idea, right? Or whatever might hold you back or feel that you might be caged sometime. Alright, one more question. Anyone? Matt? Okay. Did you have anything to say? I want to give thanks to Doreen who put up with me for us. You're the easiest artist to put up with. <laughs> but the funniest thing she said once, that was early in the process. Now I won't ask her, but she said, You're the most organized artist I've ever met. <laughs> He's laughing. Alan is laughing. <laughs> Well, you know, Henrietta, it would be lovely to end this uh, talk this afternoon with that quote that we have outside about, uh, you know, and I always substitute your comment uh, this way, I'd rather have adventure than perfection, but I know that's my contribution to it. What did you say? 
Uh, choose discovery over perfection every time. Good. Good. That's a lovely way. Thank you all for coming.